in Luke chapter 5, as we have studied all this month, there's a part of that verse that says this, when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so were James and John and the sons of Zebedee were the partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, do not be afraid. From now on you will catch men. So when they had brought their boats to the land, they forsook all and followed him. There's a time where Peter had no idea where he was going. He had no idea what was next within his life. Have you ever been there? You had no idea what was next. You had no idea what tomorrow had in store. You had no idea what you were going to do. You were just wondering what God was going to have you do. Have you ever been on vacation and you have a bunch of little kids? You know what their first question is? You, you may have 300 miles to drive. Are we there yet? <laughs> Dude, just play your game. Are, are we there? Now, now they can plug up their games and they can watch DVDs. But back in the day, back in my olden days, we didn't have DVDs. We didn't have anything. It was just read, sleep, or talk. And I was the baby of eight kids. The oldest brother was 17. I was born in a, in a <laughs> I don't even know if they make these anymore, a, a station wagon. And they didn't have eight, eight seat belts in that station wagon. I was the kid. I was thrown in the back, okay? We were going to Pikes Peak with eight kids, fighting, grumbling, arguing. We didn't get 30 miles down the street. And my dad said, if you don't shut it up, we're going to turn around. I said, no, you're not. You just spent all the money at the hotel. You're not about to do that. We knew that. He was just upset. But sometimes we just want to know when we're going to get there. Sometimes we even ask, where are we going? When are we getting there? Where are we going? You know, in life, that is one of the major questions that we have to ask. Where are we going? How am I going to get where God wants me to go? We think that in our personal life. We also think that as a country, as, as we look at these next few months, where are we going? <laughs> what in the world are we going to do? We watch the debates and watch the politics, whether we vote for Hillary or we vote for Donald or, or Rubio or, or Cruz, whoever it is. Where are we going? We have no idea what tomorrow has in store for us. The one thing that we have to ask and the bigger question that we have to ask is, what is the real question is, where are we going? Where are we going as a church? Where are we going as a nation? Where are we going as a people? Where are you going as an individual? If we cannot answer that one question of where are you going? What's gonna take place tomorrow for you? You know, I could tell you what the church is going to do tomorrow. I can tell you what the country may be trying to do, but I cannot answer the question, what are you doing? What is God wanting you to do? Because every one of us have different issues within our life. We are all so unique that God has a distinct plan for you, for tomorrow, for next month, next year, for your future. But how do we know what that is? How do we get a grasp of what God is trying to do? In this verse we found in Luke chapter 5, when Peter was in the boat, he saw who Jesus was and the power that he had, and he fell on his knees before Jesus because he realized he was God. And Jesus reached down, and he lifted him up, and he said, Peter, Peter, from now on, your life is radically going to change. You are no longer going to be Peterman the fisherman. From now on, you're going to be called an apostle a disciple of Jesus Christ. At one moment of time, everything changed. Have you ever had those moments? Have you ever had that time where one moment, one decision, one relationship, one job loss, or one death changed everything about your life? When you woke up and you, when you got up from the devastation or the fear of the anxiety, when you woke up, you knew Everything was going to change. You knew life was not going to be the same as it was. What do you do? 
What do you do? Sometimes we crumble in fear. Sometimes we have no idea what to do next. And we know from that moment, life is different. And sometimes it stinks. <laughs> sometimes we have no idea what to do. Sometimes we fall on our face before God and say, Lord, I have no idea. I just need to hear from you. I just need to hear what you want me to do. And sometimes we feel like we're in the darkest stages of our life. Sometimes we feel like we're in the desert place. We have no, we have no, no future. We have no water. We have no feeling from God. And sometimes we feel like I just need a touch from God. A single event can change the direction of your life. And if you would be honest, that single event has changed your life. Some of it for the good. Maybe through that event, you met somebody. And through that event of you meeting somebody, they have, they have given you encouragement. And maybe they've even pointed you to Christ. And somebody came alongside you and helped you out. And that event, when that person came into your life, life changed for the better. Sometimes we can look at that and you came to a church or you went to a church setting and you gave your life to Christ. And you knew from that moment, life is going to be different. But sometimes it's a phone call. Sometimes it's a piece of paper delivered to your house. Sometimes it's the doctor's report. Sometimes it's your child. And each and every one of us have issues within our life that life changed in an instant. How do we hear from God in the darkest, deepest, most hurtful ways in our life? When the Bible says when, when Peter saw the power of God, he fell on his knees and he said, depart from me, O Lord. But Peter, in the midst of his fear, Peter, on his knees, Jesus reaches up and he said, listen, I know you're scared. I know you know your life is going to change, but don't be afraid because I am going to be with you every step of the way. I will never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I wish sometimes that we all can hear the audible voice of God, that we fall on our knees before God and, and we say, Lord, please tell me what to do. And God supernaturally with an audible voice comes down and says, this is what I need you to do. This is what I want you to do. I want you to marry this person. I want you to get this job. I want you to do this or I want you to do that. But I have never heard the audible voice of God. Now God can do that. God is not in a box. He can make a donkey speak. He can do anything he wants. I have never heard it, but I have felt and I have experienced the very voice and the very presence of God. And I want to share with you, when we are going through our calamities, when we have no idea what to do, we are not a cookie-cutter cookie cut, cookie Christian. We are not all the same. We do not all have the same problems. We do not have to all go through the same events, but we all need God when we fall on our face before God, and I need to hear from him. How does he do that? How does he speak to us? The first and most important one is this, through his word. Through his word. Through the very word of God. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, it says, all scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. By the inspiration, you know what that means? God breathed. The Word of God is not a book. The Word of God is God's holy Word, God's relationship with us. It is what we have. That means God is whispering to us through His Word. Sometimes the Bible, sometimes is the last book that we pick up. Sometimes we say, where did we leave it from last Sunday? Sometimes we get it in the car, we, we leave it in the trunk, or we leave it in the church. And we, we go a week without listening to talking, to, to hearing what God has in store for us. Sometimes when we have problems with our relationships, with our kids, sometimes we say, I need to talk to God. And we sit there and we, we want God to talk to us, but we never put in our work. We never put in the word of God. We never read. We never study. We never look at what God wants to do. But God speaks to us through his word. He speaks to us through illustrations and examples. 
He speaks to us in ways that we have no idea. We can be reading the Bible and reading certain things, and you may be going through a, a situation where you're reading like the New Testament within a year, and, and you've read the same text over and over and over again, and you're just like, oh, blah, 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 and you don't get anything out of it. But all of a sudden, a major catastrophe takes place within your life. An issue has happened, and you fall on your knees before God and say, Lord, I need you. And you open up that scripture. The light bulb comes on and says, he is here. He is here. In the midst of all fear, in the midst of pain, I can take the word of God and the word of God does something for me that no one can do, no man can do, but God can do. Even when you have lack of peace. Anybody have lack of peace every once in a while? Anybody stay up at night frustrated your mind won't turn off and or is that just me? You just, you just start staying up all night and you start thinking about people and you start praying for people. You start thinking about what's taking place within your life and you're saying, Lord, I just need, I just need something. And a scripture comes across your head. Um, junior, Sissy told me today that you were gonna be in church today. And I've been visiting you in the hospital and you have some major cancer going on in your life. And we've had a lot of talks but over the last couple nights when, when I'm praying for something, you came across my mind. And I was talking about the scripture when I was talking about God breathed. I talked about how, how somebody, sometimes we just need to have peace in the midst of a storm. And this scripture, Luke chapter eight, verses 23 and 25. But as they sailed, he fell asleep and the windstorm came down on the lake and they were filling with water and were in jeopardy. And they came to him and awoke him, saying, Master, Master, are we perishing? And he, and he arose and rebuked the wind and the raging of the water, and they ceased, and there was a calm. But he said to them, Where is your faith? And they were afraid and marveled, saying to one another, Who can this be? For he commands even the winds and the waters, and they obey him. The thing that we have to do in the midst of our calamity, in the midst of our fear, in the midst of fear, and failure in the midst of our, our having no idea about tomorrow is we have to call upon him. He is not scared of tomorrow. We are scared of tomorrow. But when he is in control, he has the power to change. He has the power to calm. He has a challenge. He can do whatever he desires. So in the midst of our hurts and our hospital stays and our insecurities and our fears of tomorrow, what we must do is say, Lord, I need you. I need you to speak to me and use the word of God to open up the hearts and allow God to speak, allow God to change. So he does use the word of God and then he used through other believers. This is where you come in. This is where we get to come in. We are the church and sometimes the church can do great things. God may use a friend, a teacher, a parent, a preacher, a song to convey the message of truth to us. The words, they come from a warning or a blessing, a prophetic truth about someone's life. Whether you choose to hear it or ignore it, but sometimes God uses others to minister to his word. God can use a church and he can use an individual to use the very word of God to encourage one another. James chapter three, verse 17. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. The word of God can speak through individuals, can speak through different issues. The word of God can speak through believers. Now, I don't believe in this, though. I don't like what Al's doing. So I say, the Lord told me to tell you to stop, okay? Sometimes the Lord gets blamed for a lot of things the Lord didn't care about. And you cheating on your golf game last week, the Lord did not care, although I caught you. He, Al says the best wood in his bag is his pencil. <laughs> so, and that's what he uses a lot. Um, but sometimes when we say, the Lord told me to say this, or the Lord wants this for you, the Lord told me to tell you this, you know what, you better just ask the Lord to give him wisdom and to give his advice. But if you are in a setting where somebody comes up to you, somebody is in need, and somebody is struggling, and you are their confidant. You don't have the right to go up to a stranger and gift him then the word of God, but what you do have is you have the right to befriend them and to love them 
and encourage them. And then when they have an issue, they accept you and say, I need your help. When we build relationships, God can use those relationships to speak the truth with purity, vulnerability, transparency, without hypocrisy can be the word of God. And he uses the body of Christ. He uses the church, but it is not for a bully pulpit. It's for a loving way to encourage, to help others through their situation. And then he speaks through circumstances sometimes. Through circumstances. And, and I believe circumstances to be true. But I believe circumstances alone can be very chaotic. Because I heard this guy that he wanted to buy this brand new truck. And he's been praying for this truck. Lord, I need this truck. I want this, this dually and I need this. I need all this. And it was about $45,000 truck. Anybody crazy enough to spend $45,000 on a truck? I don't know. But spend $45,000 on a truck. And it was a silver truck. and had, had the, the long cab on it. It was a dually. And uh, he walked up and he said, that's what I've been praying for. I've been praying for that. So he said, God, that must be a sign to go get it. So they went in and they went to the financing office. And they said, this is what I want. This is what I want on it. And he said, sir... You can't afford that truck. We have pre-approved you for 15000 and the truck is 40000 And you may say, well, God said. I didn't say that. You just drove by a parking lot. We cannot allow the parking lot to be the circumstance of how we love something. Another this, a circumstance of God cannot go against God's word. If a circumstance that you think is of God, but it contradicts the word of God, it is just a circumstance. But a circumstance that tells this is what God wants and this is how God is working and it backs up by the word of God and by testimony of other believers, then you can look at that. That may be God's will for your life, but it cannot and it will not ever contradict God's word. God's word is absolute authority and truth. So any way that God speaks it has to be brought through God's word. God spoke through Moses, through circumstances with the plagues. He spoke uh, in a lot of different circumstances to do God's will. Circumstances can be true. And I believe when I stand before people and they get married, I ask them one question. Do you believe God put you two together? Do you believe God put you two together? Because if God didn't put you two together, it may have just been circumstances and you get along really well. But when you put God in the center of the circumstances of how you got together, God put you together. God worked a, a way in your life that you had that camaraderie and you love each other. God can work through circumstances, and he does. But he also baptizes those circumstances with the word of God to find out if it's true. And then through the church. Jesus took Peter to carry on the work. In John chapter 17, verses 20 through 21, Jesus is, there's three prayers in John chapter 17. He prays for himself, and then he prays for his disciples, and he prays for the rest of the believers. And he says this in John chapter 17, verses 20 through 21. I do not pray for these alone, and just not for the disciples, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they will be one as you are, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me, the church. He has given to us the ability, the opportunity, and also the necessity to be the voice piece of God. Not necessarily to speak for God, but to speak with God to give out the word of God and to teach the doctrines. God has placed Glenville at this point for a particular reason. Some of you may be here for a very short time. Some of you may have been here for a long time. But the main purpose of Glenville is to proclaim the truth of Jesus Christ and to proclaim the message that he and he alone is the only way to salvation. That is the mandate that this church has. And whenever somebody can see that and they come into the church and they see that Jesus Christ can change their life, they may have all kinds of questions. But it has to be the foundational point. This is where we start. We can't fix your life unless Jesus fixes your soul. And once your soul has been redeemed, then we can get into life change. How do we do that? It's not just coming into the church. 
God, our faith and our, our, our church must be bigger than these four walls. If our church is only here on Sunday morning, these four walls, we're in a world of hurt. It goes through community groups. It gets into people's lives. It tells people that they ought to do something. In, in Luke chapter 9, verse 2, Jesus, he sent them out to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. He, he broke them up in, in, in small groups. And he said, he said go, go. I, Jesus did not want his disciples to stay in a small group and to, to read the Bible, to try to learn the Bible, to try to learn his ways. He said, I want you to go. I want you to go out and do something. Small groups. Learn the Bible, but do certain things. Get involved with doing what God wants you to do. If Glenville would dissolve today, if the IRS would come into there here and say, you owe $2.5 million, and you are, if you don't pay by next Sunday, the doors are gone. The doors are shut. We're out of here. What impact would that make in your life? What impact would that make in your kid's life? What impact would that make in our community? Because we have to say, if it's only for the people that's within the doors, then we're not making the impact that we need to make. The question then would be, who are you serving? If the church is serving, or if the church is self-serving, then we are serving ourselves. We are not making an impact in our community. But when you look at ways to serve, whether it's in the church or outside the church, whether it's with your resources or without your resources. Uh, Joe, I'm gonna, where's Joe at? I just saw you, Joe Young. Um, Joe comes in every week and she takes the, the pews, the chairs, and she stuffs the back of the chairs with a pencil and the offering um, envelope and the prayer card. Every week she comes in. She didn't have to do that. But she says, how can I serve? How can I serve? How can I do something for the church? And she's been doing this for years. A few months ago, a few weeks ago, she came in and said, I have a family member that passed away, and we were wondering, can we use the church? You know what I said? <laughs> Absolutely. You don't even have to ask. When you serve the body of Christ, the body of Christ serves you. It doesn't cost you anything because we just want to be part of your life and we want to serve you. And when we serve, people get blessed. We need to be generous. We need to be generous. How do we, how do, we do certain things? In our lives, do we impact in faith? Our faith is bigger than what we could ever possibly imagine. We need to get involved. How do we get involved? Uh, one of the things is through sports ministries. Coach a team. Whether it's at the church or it's at the Y, if you're involved in sports, just coach a team. You know what, when those little kids look up to you and you can have that positive influence and you can pray with them and you can encourage them, you can change their life and God can use them to change your life. Through music ministry, being able to share your heart through nursery or preschool. John Bacon and I were in uh, Tanzania a few years ago, and uh, I want to tell you about our missions endeavor. Um, we were at a city council meeting, and uh, we went there with about seven or eight other pastors, and uh, we were sitting around this table, and they were doing the dancing, and, and the, they were showing us what's going on, and, and uh, we were meeting with them about what we could serve them and how we could minister to them. And it was a little village outside of Dar es Salaam. So we set out, and, and our, our goal at that time was going to open up a feeding center in this little village that had no running water, and they had, had no education. It was a small little town, and uh, it was awesome to see the entire city come alongside. So we sat at the head table, and everybody sat around, and they were listening and talking, and, and they were giving us uh, reports and what's going on in their city, and then we got to talk to them about the Lord and talk to them about the report. But the bottom line in that little village, right outside of Dar es Salaam, they needed one main thing. They didn't, well, they needed Jesus. But physically, they needed one thing, and they came to us and asked us for one thing. And that was a well in the city of their town so they could live. So through the pastors that we worked with through Manna Worldwide, we went back to that village, and we gave them the resources, and we dug them a well. And now in that little village, there's a well that those little kids are living now 
and they don't have to walk two or three miles just to get running water. They have it in their own little city. I was thinking that's what missions would do. You know, generosity is when somebody can't pay you back and you can serve them anyway, that is what we are supposed to do. We are supposed to look for somebody and love them and help them. When they can't do something for themselves, we do something for them. That's how we can allow God to speak to us and through us. And then the fifth thing is through his spirit. Through his spirit. John chapter 14, verse 17. The spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor hears him, but you know him, for he dwells with you, and he will be in you. The Spirit of God that lives within every believer. When things take place, when calamities happen, when you fall on your face before God in that still small voice, you feel the power and the presence of God can change everything. This is where believers hear and understand God, called the Spirit of God. In 1 Corinthians 3, 16, do you not know that your temple is of God and is the Spirit of God that dwells within you? The Spirit of God. Here's the, one of the couple of neatest things about the Spirit of God is, have you ever got to a point you were so broken or so hurt or so confused, you didn't know what to say? You just cried. You didn't know what to do. You didn't know what to say. You didn't know how to say it. And, and you fell on your face before God. And, and all you heard was the tears and nothing could come out of your mouth. You know what the Bible says the Spirit does? The Spirit of God that lives within your heart takes your heart and takes your mind. And he makes the mind and your heart the utterances that cannot be spoken. He is the intercessor and he takes those prayers and gives them to God. Because God looks at the heart. We don't have to have the words that are spoken so eloquently. But God wants to see our heart deep within your heart. And when you are broken and your life is changing and things are falling apart and you don't know what to say, you know what? You don't have to say. You just bow your face before God and say, Lord, I need you. And the Holy Spirit that takes residence within our soul he sees us and he hears us and he knows us and he takes our prayers and he ushers them to the very throne of God. That's a spirit that lives within us. And the world, they don't have that. That's only for believers that have accepted him as their Lord and Savior. The Holy Spirit comes within your life. He takes residence. He takes over and he challenges you. He doesn't want you to stay where you are, but the Holy Spirit is a way that we hear from God. God. This is the awkward one for me. I'm up here preaching a sermon. It could be on any topic. You name a topic. And I'm just preaching away. I'm just talking about certain things. And, and after the sermon is over with, I'm standing in the back and they say, man, did my wife call you this week? <laughs> Dude, what we fought about last night, you hit right on the head. I go over to the other person and say, man, my family, my kids were going through that exact same issue. And I tell you what, the words that you spoke is exactly what we needed to do. Or I go over here and somebody says, I need to buy that tape and I need to give it to so-and-so because they're going through that same scenario. I may not have even talked about what they're going through, but the Holy Spirit of God takes the Word of God, the breathed Word of God, and he applies it, and he gives ointment to the need of our life, and it changes us because God is the one that speaks. It is not a man that speaks. This is God's word speaking through the power of the Holy Spirit within your life. And your need and my need can only be fixed by God. And he speaks in a lot of different ways. And he speaks to you in a lot of different ways. And one other thing, the Spirit of God can speak in different wonderful ways to give us hope. But let me tell you the last and the one that is neglected the most, and that is through prayer. When I was a youth pastor for many years, um, we would try to get the disciplines of the fundamentals of teaching and reading and 
praying into the kids. And uh, this is one that uh, most kids say, I just, I just don't do. I'm weak at it. I, I, can, I can open the Bible every once in a while, but the prayer thing is just not really something that I do a lot. I may pray for dinner, I may pray for lunch, or I may pray if somebody asks me to, but, but for me to get alone with God, just to talk to God, just to allow God to speak to me, this is one of the least things that I do. And this is the, probably the most important thing that you can do. Because let me tell you how God speaks to you. He uses the word of God. But in prayer, it is the most humbled aspect of God's working in your life. When you pray, humbly pray, you're saying, I submit to you. When you're saying, I need to pray to God because I can't fix this on my own, you're saying, God, I'm giving my problem to you. And in those prayers are the times of the quiet stillness of our hearts and our lives that the word of God can come and give you ointment of help, peace that passeth all understanding. When you are in trouble, when you are down, when you are out, when it says fall on your face before God, it doesn't say just out of humility, fall on your face before God. It means surrender my problem, my anger, my fear, my problem to God. He may not lift you up and say, here's your magic pill. But what he will do is he'll give you the ability to listen and learn. The first step that we have to do in order to hear God, you ready for this? Shut up and listen to him. Sometimes we're so busy giving the answers to God, we don't listen to God. Be still and know that I am God. We don't have all the answers. I wish the Bible gave me every answer that I ever needed. And it gives me ideas and gives me thoughts and gives me illustrations, and, but I don't know everything. The Bible doesn't give me every answer that I need about every situation. But the Spirit of God can give me utterance. And the peace of God can give me the calmness. But the prayer to God lets me calm my spirit, surrender my soul, that's when God can speak because I'm not in the way. Amen. Prayer. Why don't we pray? Let me tell you why we don't pray. We're too busy. We don't know how. We don't like giving up control. And you haven't been broken enough. Because once we are hurting enough that we know we can't do it on our own, we will pray because we don't have any place else to go. And the brokenness of a man or a woman's heart, the best place they go is to fall on their face before God and say, Lord, I need your help in your calamity, your worst calamity, you name it. The thing that you wish would have never happened. You wish that nothing like this would ever happen to anyone else. That calamity, that issue. When you in the center of your biggest issue within your life and you fell on your face before God, you're saying, Lord, I can't fix this. I need you. And that's when God comes within your life and he gives you the peace and he gives you understanding and he lets you know, you know what? It is going to be tough. The road is hard, but I want you to know I'm not going to straighten the road. I'm not going to make the road disappear. But what I am going to do, I'm going to walk beside you on the road. And when Jesus walks beside us on the road, we know that I can lean on him. He can give us direction. He can give us inspiration. He can give us motivation. I'm not doing this by myself. I'm doing this for and with God. And when we can do that, that is the greatest thing that he could do for us. You are unique. God speaks to all people but he does not speak to all people the same way. He wants to speak to you. We are all unique. He always wants to help you. He always wants to encourage you. Sometimes he wants to rebuke you. Sometimes we need that rebuking. As a pastor in the word of God, my, my job is to motivate the truth of Jesus Christ. 
My job is to motivate that we all need Jesus to go to heaven. But we also have to rebuke, to confront, and to instruct. And sometimes in the word of God, sometimes we need to pray. Sometimes we need to open up God's word. Sometimes we need to look into the future and say, I don't know where I am going, but I know that I'm going to follow my face before God, and I'm going to find out what he wants me to do, where he wants me to go. This issue, this time in my life, I, it's going to be different. I just met Jesus. I am changing my life. I am changing my direction. I'm giving it up. I'm stopping this, or I'm going to work on that. And I need Christ in order to fix it. In our future... Where's Jesus? In your life, where's Jesus? Do you talk to him? Does he talk to you? Here in a couple of months is Easter. And in church, the Easter week is one of the most important weeks of the church. We're going to have a packed house in here. We're going to have a challenge to communicate and bring our family and our friends to church on Easter Sunday morning. And we do not believe that Easter will be successful unless the body of Christ makes it successful. See, coming to church does not make Easter successful. Having every pew full does not make Easter successful. Having standing room only does not make Easter successful. Having good music does not make Easter successful. You know what makes Easter successful? Is what we're going to do the week before Easter. We're going to have what's called a, a, a prayer power punch. We are going to have two hours of prayer time on the Sunday night before Easter. And we're going to have different rooms open up, and we're going to have cards. We're going to have the body of Christ coming in the week before Easter. And we're going to pray for every issue within the church, in personal lives, in people's lives, hurting lives, things that people are going through. Because you know what? When they come in church on Easter, we don't want them to walk out and say, Oh, that was wonderful. We don't want it to be wonderful. We want it to be life-changing. We want their life to mean something and to fall on their face before God. I met Jesus today. I was hurting, and Christ transformed my life. If they walk out the doors on Easter Sunday morning like we do, and it doesn't change their life, good job, Glenville. Great job. We're not here for the acclimates of men. We're here to honor Christ. So on that Sunday night before Easter, we we're going to have a prayer time for two hours in different areas of the church for different things. And then that Friday, Good Friday, we're going to call the church to prayer through the Lord's Supper. We're going to have a Friday night, Christmas, fr Friday night um, Good Friday communion service. Take about an hour. We're going to call the church to prayer again. And with expectation... With Jesus' power, with God's authority, we're going to open up the doors on Easter Sunday morning. And you know what we're going to expect? We're going to expect the power of God to go through you, to go through your prayers, and go through the very words that God has given to us because we are prepared for them to walk through our doors. How does God speak to you? Through motivation. He speaks to you through the very word of God, through the spirit of God, through, through prayers, through church, through everyone that we come in contact with. When we can give the word of God, we never know what people are going through. You know, I can look in people's lives. I, I've been here long enough now that I can look in this section and I can just look at people. And as soon as I look at people, I, I can have a, a smile on my face one second, then I can have a tear in my eye instantaneously. I can look and I can tell issues that you guys are going through in every, every area. There's not, a, there's not a family that comes to this church that there's not so much junk going on in their life, so much hurt and there's so much pain that it does just break your heart. You, you, you can't go anywhere without seeing the hurt and the pain. And that's the people that go here. That's the people that love Jesus that are called to be according to his purpose and called under this church. We have the power of God. Why, why can't we take our hurts and our pains and our issues and take it and understand, you know what, I want to be the voice of God.
to the people out there that do not have the spirit within their life and to be that ointment and to allow them to see Christ in me so they can bring and hear Christ and give their life to Jesus. You know the church? I believe if the church would do that, the church would be radically different than it is today. Radically different. And that's the, and that's the rebuking part. If the church was gone tomorrow, would we be any different? Would you just go to a different church? Would you just go down the street? If the church, if Glenville isn't making an impact within your life, we need to change it. We need to allow God to work deeper and greater and bigger things. But if you can say, let me tell you what Glenville means to me. Let me tell you what Christ did for me through this church. What can I do to make others see Christ the way that Glenville or somebody within the church allowed me to see Christ? Let's radically change the way that we see where we are going. Because where we are going cannot be where we've already been. Where we are going has to be where God wants us to go. Peter could always have been a fisherman. But when he met God, he said, I'm not worthy to be around you. He got up, he forsook all, and he said, now we're going this way. It doesn't mean past was bad. It doesn't mean today is not good. It means tomorrow in the power of God can be better than what we've ever experienced before. That's what we want. Where are we going? The answer is, I have no idea where we're going to end up. But I tell you one thing, as long as we are going where Jesus wants us to go, we will be successful. It'll be, it'll be hard. It'll make you change. You may have to get your Bible out. You may have to pray. You may have to minister. You may have to be uncomfortable to do what God wants you to do. But if you do what God wants you to do, you're no longer going to be fishers of ma- a fisher of men. No, you're no longer going to be a fisher man. You're going to be a fisher of men. That's hard to do when you're talking fast. But that's what God wants us to do is to go out and teach and to love and to help people see Christ. That's our challenge. The song that Justin sang right before he got off the platform is, I bow down and I need you. I need you. I need you. I sometimes believe that we don't hear God because we don't think we need God. And once we need God, we'll fall on our face and we'll ask God. The church too long has been so image oriented that we're afraid what somebody might think or what somebody might say after we leave. And that image of pride is the worst image that a church could ever have. When a church has the image of You're my brother and sister in Christ. And when you have stuff going on in your life, I want you to be prayed for. I want to encourage you. I want to help you. Until the church gets the mindset that we need to come to church on Sunday morning to lift each other up, to pray for one another, to love one another, to give advice and to give instructions to one another, we'll never be the family that God wants us to be. When somebody comes down to pray, it's not, oh, I want to wonder what's going on in their life. It's none of your stinking business what's going on in their life. You have enough problems with what's going on in your life. You're just too prideful to come down and talk about it. But when we pray as a brother and sister in Christ to wrap our arms around somebody and love them and help them and encourage them, that's when we can hear the very words of God. Sometimes our actions allow God to speak to us and through us. Are we willing to do that? Are we willing to pray? Are we willing to seek God's face? Let me go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Father, Lord, we come before you, and Lord, we speak to you. And Lord, what we need is we need you to come into our hearts and our lives to give us boldness to communicate to others, to allow us to know the truth Allow us to know that the word of God is breathed by you and is profitable 
And you will never allow the word of God to go un unused. So whatever we say and however we say it, that you will straighten it out and you will attach it to hearts of man and you will allow it to come back to bring glory and honor to you. So Lord, be with us today. Prepare our hearts. Allow us to hear your voice in the still small voice, the direction of our life. Allow us to always trust you. Allow the word of God to work within us. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Amen. Brilliant.